we're recording. All right. Well, uh, I think we're getting some stragglers in, but we shall start. Uh, thanks for coming out, everybody, today to Marky Microwave's, I believe, third webinar. And today's topic is on a brief guide to mixer spurs. I am Chris Markey, CEO and lead mixer designer. And I'm here with Harley, one of our up and coming engineers. Say hi, Harley. Hi, I'm Harley. I've been working at Marky Microwave for about a year now. Been working really closely with mixers and recently been studying spurs. So today, Chris and I are going to talk a bit about spurs and we're going to have a poll open right now. You should see it now and you can answer these as Chris goes through his slides. About halfway through, I'll take over, go over the answers and then start talking about some applications. Yes, and you will be graded. All <laughs> right, so let's get the show on the road. Okay, so by the end of today's talk, we hope to, that the audience will be able to answer some important questions. Uh, what is a spur? Um, where do they come from? Why do they exist in the first place? How do we reduce their impact at both the system and the design or mixer level? And how do we predict and model them? And finally, how do we measure them? And we'll, at the very end, we'll have a Q&A if, if we don't cover certain things or are just flat out confusing because that is the norm. Okay, so um, I'm a mixer guy and I think about mixers in basically two categories. I think about the linear specs and I think about the nonlinear specs. Uh, the linear specs are well known, things like bandwidth, conversion loss, isolation, and return loss. And then there's the nonlinear specs, things like third order input intercept, or spur spurious M by N products, which is the topic of today, or 1DB compression. Um, the nonlinear specs tend to be the most confusing, the hardest to deal with, and they tend to dominate the dynamic range of a particular system. And within that category, spurs are, I would say, by far the most confusing and annoying to deal with. Um, spur debugging is very time consuming, it's, it's very resource intensive. And it can just be a complete time suck on, the, on a project, um, both at the mixer design level, but also at the, at the system level. We, we spend a lot of time on the app side helping customers uh, figure out how to get rid of certain spurs or re-engineer a, a particular architecture to, to reduce the impact. So hopefully uh, we can give you guys some, some tips and tricks to, to deal with that today. So where do spurs come from? Um, it's pretty well known. Hopefully everybody understands that if you hit a nonlinear circuit with multiple input tones, those input tones will mix or nonlinear intermo uh, non intermodulate um, in the circuit to create uh, a blend or a mixture of many other tones. So in other words, um, if we inject two signals into a system, we'll get out a, a, a plethora of other tones that are spread in frequency. And so those tones are mathematically related to one another through various harmonic numbers. So uh, at the outputs, we can get the fundamental or the second harmonic or the, the difference or some frequency, which is what we, we like to have in a mixer. So these two tones right here, uh, we can get the two by one or the, well, that should be one by two. Um, but general, the generalized version of this um, is what we call the M by N product. So the M and N are integers and we have M times the first frequency plus or minus N times the second frequency. Um, this happens in all nonlinear interactions and in mixers, we try to control this to only end up with this, these two particular tones and get rid of the rest. So the key questions that um, this, this analysis would, would pose are, are which M by N products matter? Um, because it's, it, it's certainly true that not everyone matters. Um, how big are they going to be in terms of their relative magnitude or power? And then uh, how do we get rid of them? So the origin of spurs comes from the interaction of the LO signal and the small signal RF. And so everybody's familiar with the IV characteristic of a diode, and they're familiar with the fact that it's a, a nonlinear function, um, typically characterized as an exponential. The point is that the switching functionality in a mixer is related to the, the, um, the turning on and turning off of a diode. And so I like to explain the IF current creation of this particular simple circuit as just being the, um, the current coming out is uh, the multiplication of the, the input voltage in time times the switching function or, or switching conductivity in time. Um, I borrowed this from really the initial uh, 
uh, analysis that Bert Henderson did in his switching model, which I'll explain in a moment. But if you look at the, the time domain output of this particular input signal, which is just uh, two cosines added together into this IV curve, what you get is this particular chopped uh, quasi sine wave looking function. And if you take the frequency or a Fourier transform of this and look at it in the frequency domain, you see that we've spread energy throughout the spectrum from um, the one by one, which is this particular tone right here at the very low end. And then here's the two by two, the three by three. Here are the leakage terms and other two by ones and so on. And so in a mixer or really in any, any system really, um, including things like amplifiers and, and, and other nonlinear func um, nonlinear devices, uh, this is considered to be bad. And we don't want all these other tones. So, so the question is, how do we get rid of them? Uh, so I like to use the Bert Henderson model because I think it, it adds a lot of intuitive uh, physical understanding of what's happening. And so if you just take this basic idea that the, the output current is related to the conductivity and the input voltage, then um, the formal uh, expansion of that would be into this, this function. I'm not going to get too much into the math here, but I just want to point out a couple of important features of this function. First of all, um, all of the inner modulation distortion really comes from the switching function itself. So, so what does the conductivity look like in time? And as it turns out, and, and as um, Harley will explain, or well, as Bert shows in his analysis, and Harley will kind of explain a little bit later, um, this switching function is dependent on both the LO voltage in time and the RF voltage in time. And this is where the cross or intermodulation happens. The other thing that I want to point out is that the spur phases are, are not necessarily the same depending on what N and N product you have and then what the relative phase between the two of them are. And so we use this as, as I'll show in a few slides to, um, as a way to cancel certain spurs but accept other spurs at various positions in a circuit. So um, at the mixer design level, there are, I would say four major categories or, or, or methods by which we get rid of spurious products. The first and most popular and, 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 and most well understood, I would say, is the idea of circuit balance. So in this case, we're going to do an analysis, anal an analysis of M by N products and double balance mixers and explain how this comes to be. Then there's also LO waveform engineering, which really is just this idea of, of um, switching on and off the, the diode or the switch as quickly as possible to um, eliminate or reduce the impact of the small signal intermod. Uh, there is this idea of device stacking, which is just making the diode turn on at such a high power that the small signal is unable to turn it on and off, leading to lower levels of distortion. And then finally, this idea of feedback linearization, which is a really it's IP related to what Marky does with our T3 mixer. So um, as I mentioned in two slides ago, the M by N products do not necessarily have the same phase. Um, and it's related by this function as set up in Bert's uh, initial model. And let's take the special case of assuming that we restrict the phases to be either zero or pi. So if there's only two possible states and two variables, we end up with four possible scenarios. There's a in phase, in phase, there's in phase, out of phase, out of phase, in phase, and both out of phase. And so let's, Let's go through the, the math real quick. And then what we're going to determine is what is the phase of the relative uh, spurious product. So in the, in, in the simplest case, we have both LO and RF are in phase with the diode polarity. In this case, we end up having that theta and phi are, are zero. So we have e to, the, e to the J zero for all M by N products, meaning that we have the current flowing in the positive or, or um, in the in the direction of the diode. Now instead, let's assume that theta is um, pi and phi is zero. In this case, we would end up with e to the j and pi plus zero. So e to the j and pi, e to the j pi is negative one. So we have negative one to the nth power. In other words, if n is odd, current will flow in the reverse direction of the diode. And if N is even, it will flow in the positive direction. And so the same thing happens to the even by odds, or let's see, well, the same thing happens when 
LO is in phase and RF is out of phase. And so we would get negative one to the nth power. And then finally, if they're both out of phase with the direction of the diode, we would not end up with negative one m plus n to the m plus nth power. So what are we saying here? What we're saying is that the phase of a particular inner mod depends on its m by n value and whether they're even or odd. And so we have these four combinations and it's possible, as I'll show in the next slide, to phase these things in such a way that we end up rejecting most of what we don't like and accepting what we do like. So how do we do it? Well, if you take a diode ring, if you take four diodes and you put them in a ring configuration, and then you drive this ring with a differential signal, so you have VLO plus up here, VLO minus here, VRF plus here, VRF minus here, um, and you can see the simple low frequency equivalent circuit that people tend to show in textbooks. And when you do the analysis of the currents and their polarities and the directions, you end up finding that the uh, diode one from the previous slide is the here. Here's diode two, here's diode three, here's diode four. And as I said, and we just derived that the IF currents have this particular polarity relationship. So now we ask the question, what happens when they're both odd? What happens when one is odd, one is even? Even odd, and then even even. And let's analyze where these currents are flowing. So in the initial case of odd, 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 this is the scenario for mixing of a fundamental frequency to the sum of the difference. So what we want out typically in a mixer is a one by one product. So really what we're doing is deriving where is the IF current going? And in this case, what we find is that the currents will flow in this, in this sort of path. So they'll come out of the RF, uh, split into the ring and flow out of the LO path in phase. So we get this collection of IF or one by, sorry, we get a collection of odd by odd currents flowing in phase into this ground like this. Since they're in phase coming into this magic T, that means that this port is mutually isolated, meaning that the odd by odd product does not show up at the LO, but instead flows down to ground um, in phase and then comes back out through the IF load like this. So you have this perfect IF completed circuit. So what are we saying? We're saying that the current flows through the IF port when you're talking about odd by odd products, which is exactly what we would expect to see. We would expect to see that if we inject an LO and an RF, that the one by one, whether it's plus or minus, it actually doesn't matter. Um, but the one by one product shows up at the IF as you, as you would hope. This also, as I also mentioned, um, the LO port will be isolated and so will the RF port because these currents are in phase in these two nodes. Therefore, it's mutually isolated at the, what's called the delta port of the magic T. So we have a mutual isolation and no by odd, odd, odd products at these ports. Um, I would also point out that not just the one by one would show up. This also means the three by one would show up at the IF, the three by three would show up at the IF, the five by three. And you, there's nothing that a double balance mixer can do about that. Odd by odds will always show up in this manner. Okay, let's look at even by odds. In the case of even by odd, you get um, uh, the, the resulting vectors of the currents to be flowing in this sort of downward looking direction. So what we find at the circuit level is that the currents will flow in this circular pattern through the, I, or through the LO ballon or through the LO magic T um, in a differential phase meaning that if you have a differential current going this way, then you're gonna induce another current in the opposite direction going this way, meaning that the even by odds, believe it or not, show up at the LO port. But um, we do have virtual ground set up at these two nodes, meaning that the IF and the RF are mutually, mutually isolated from the even and odd mode. So the conclusion of this particular um, cartoon is that the current flows through the LO port and the RF and the IF are isolated from all even and odd mode signals or even by odd mode signals. Let's flip it and go to odd by even. Same thing happens, but for the RF port. So the current will flow in this direction. We'll induce current um, in the RF load or the RF uh, source, depending on how you think about it. And um, so current flows through the RF port and no odd by even current is present at the L or the I because of the, the nature of the way these currents are flowing. And then finally, what happens to the even by evens? The even by even is interesting because 
the current will flow in this circular pattern, meaning that it basically gets trapped in the LO ring itself or in the diode ring itself. And no current in theory will be present um, at the L, the R, or the I. So all even by evens um, stay within the mixer circuit and never actually escape. So what have we concluded based on this analysis? Um, basically, we've used the idea that intermodulation distortion or, or spurs have a certain phase and that phase is related to the M by N product. And if we use multiple devices or multiple diodes, we can force these currents to sometimes cancel and sometimes not cancel. Or in other words, we use constructive or destructive interference to accept or reject certain tones at specific locations within the circuit. Uh, in a double balance mixer, odd by odds flow through the R IF port and they're mutually isolated at the RF and LO. Even by odds cancel at the RF and the IF, but they flow through the LO port. Odd by even cancel at LO and IF, but flow through the RF. And then the even, even by evens cancel at all three ports and circulate within the diode ring. So this was, you know, a very cartoony way of explaining how these things are working. And it, of course, in real life, we know that this isn't um, universally the, the case. What we end up having is um, some residual amount of spurs that will be present at these, at these ports. And this is all caused by the fact that in our analysis, we have assumed perfect equal and, and opposite amplitude and, and phase. And so in a, re, in a real life scenario, we'll have a re, uh, an imperfect balance of this mixer circuit, and that will result in residual powers of unwanted tones at these, at these ports. And so the true art of mixer design is to, is, is to design the balance structures and the, and the passive structures and the layout of the mixer and all these other things and setting the, the power levels just correctly to, to minimize uh, the values as much as possible. But I should say that the majority of, of spurious, rejection, spurious rejection and balanced mixers comes from this balancing technique. And everything else I'm gonna sh share with you after this is just in addition to the, the, um, the DBC levels that are, are gained by the, um, the balance itself. So uh, we've covered circuit balance techniques. Uh, let's talk about the other three main categories that um, contribute to IMD improvement. So I mentioned this earlier that uh, the switching function really is the, the cause of the intermods in, in the switching mixer analysis. And the general treatment of the switching or the, the switching conductance is that it's a function of both the LO and RF signal. But it can be shown, and I'm not going to go through the derivation in this particular talk, but it can be shown very easily that if the switching function is not a function of RF, that, the, that you can end up with a really nice scenario where you only end up with intermods that are um, the one by odd products of the, of the LO. In other words, you can eliminate the, the higher order terms of the small signal RF by making the switching function only a function of LO. And we do this very simply by switching the LO very fast on and off with the square wave. There's a, there's a really nice intuitive way I like to explain how the square wave uh, operates um, to reduce intermod and it's this. If you imagine that the intermods are created in this small amount of time in which the, the diode is neither on nor off. So, so in this sort of squishy, squishy between zero and VF of the diode uh, transition phase. Um, in, that's when the small signal is strong enough to intermodulate the currents. But when the diode is hard on or hard off, that small signal doesn't have, let's say, the, the, the power or the, the, the inertial capability to perturb the, the current um, flowing through the diode. And so the ideal scenario would be that the LO completely dominates the LO on or off condition. And, and, and we can achieve that by having the LO operate in this sort of um, bipolarity, either very strong on or very strong off condition. And if we can get through that transition very quickly, um, it would reason to, it would make a reason, you can make a reasonable argument that the intermods should also go down. And indeed that is the case. Um, in this particular experiment, we took a sine wave LO uh, and a square wave LO with exactly the same um, 
voltage swing and you inject this mixer and you can see that when you inject a square wave LO into that same mixer, you end up reducing the tones. It's really interesting actually be, um, because we're showing a down conversion here. So this is a two by two tone. This is a three by three, a four by four and a five by five. And what we're seeing is that all tones are reducing. Um, if you remember what I said earlier in a balanced mixer, you don't actually reject odd by odds at the I port. So a three by three in theory is not rejected at all because of a balance, but you can see that a square wave does force the, uh, the three by three to go down. Now, why is that the case? Well, because it's, because a square wave affects, um, or it, the limit of a square wave is that you only end up with one by odds. So three by three is not a one by odd, it's a three by three. If I were to show you um, in the spectrum, the, the one by three, you would see it did not change between this particular result and this one. In fact, I think it gets slightly worse because you're injecting a, a strong third harmonic. But almost nobody cares about a one by three term, so that's considered um, a completely acceptable trade-off. But the bottom line is that if I can drive with a very hard square wave, a very fast rise time square wave, I can reject inner mods. And this is done throughout the mixer world beyond just diode mixers. This is uh, extremely common in, in CMOS mixers. And you can see various CMOS mixers on, in the industry, which have built-in LO buffers. And you can, you can pretty much uh, predict what the rise time of that square wave is based on the technology and the inner mods uh, resulting that they're showing on the, in the data sheets. But um, unfortunately, above 10 gigahertz, this gets very difficult. Why is that? Well, it's very difficult to make super broadband LO balance because uh, recall that in order to, to accept the square wave into the diode ring, I would have to, or the diode um, part of the mixer, I would have to have many odd harmonics. So that can be very difficult at high frequency. Imagine you were driving at a 30 gigahertz LO, that would mean that the, the third harmonic is 90. Um, good luck finding a, tech, uh, a broadband enough circuit that's gonna do that. Then you have uh, the problem of the LO buffer amp for the same reasons. So if I, wanna, if I wanna have fifth and seventh order terms, I probably have to have a lower frequency uh, LO, uh, a lower frequency LO. And then of course, the other thing is that the devices must actually be able to switch that fast. So you have this compounding um, practical challenge, which is that the balance have to be broad, the amps have to be uh, broad, and the devices have to be fast. So in my view, and in, 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 in practical scenarios, the square wave LO benefits tend to diminish above 10 gigahertz. So what do we do above 10 gigahertz? Well, we have other options. Um, and, and that has to do with playing with the forward voltage of the diodes or, or making them essentially higher power diodes. So what's happening? Um, well, it's similar to, to this idea of like um, the fact that a, every mixer diode requires a specific power to be turned on and turned off. And so whenever we, we use mixers with low barrier diodes, we have a range of LO drive that, um, that will optimize the mixer. And if I double that, that forward voltage of the mixer, then I would require roughly a 60 dB more LO drive. But at the same, but this benefits me because it means that the, the small signal tone is um, 60 dB smaller by relative magnitude compared to the LO. And when, when the LO becomes much larger than the RF, the LO dominates the switching function and it reduces the inner mod created in the mixer. So um, it's pretty commonly known that we can, we can fabricate and, and design with different diodes. So we can have low barrier diodes turning on around point two, five or 0.3 volts. We can have what we call standard barrier, which, which have a turn on voltage around 0.7 volts. And, and, and novelly, we can stack these diodes to create even higher order um, turn on voltages. So if we take two of them, we stack them and we double the voltage. So we can take uh, a double stack or what, what Marky calls an S diode and achieve roughly a 1.3 to 1.4 volt turn on. What this does is it allows us to improve the spurs through scaling. So um, the scaling rule of thumb is that the, 
the spur improvement will go as m minus one times 20 log of the, the, the voltage ratio. So if, the, if you stack two diodes, that's a doubling. So it's a, a log of two. So 20 log of two is six dB times m minus one. So that means that the second order m terms will improve six dB. The third orders will improve 12, the fourth orders 18 and so on. And this can have a tremendous benefit when you're trying to squeak out the final amount of, of dBc in your dynamic range. Um, I thought I saved this, but I didn't, but that's okay. Uh, there's a typo here. But anyway, um, let's take an example of a three RF by two LO in a measurement. And what we did in this measurement is we measured, sorry, we measured this low barrier diode mixer and an identical mixer built with this standard barrier diode. The three by two was measured to be 54 dBC in the low barrier. And that low barrier was measured at 0.28 volts. And then we had a 71 dBC um, measurement for the standard barrier, which is a 0.69. If we plug that into here, we predict that the improvement would have been 20, would have been 15 dB. What we measure is actually 17, that's not 13, that should be a 17 dB. So, but the error is still two dB, which is, which is quite good given that's just a, a crude rule of thumb that um, that can be quickly estimated. So if you if you're if you're working in a scenario where you need uh, four or five dB more dynamic range, uh, or you need your spur to be pushed down four or five dB, one one option would be to double the volt the forward voltage, and you could do that, for example, by instead of using a Marky standard mixer, use the S diode mixer. Um, this, this problem also, or th th this technique also helps IP3 and you can show that the IP3 also will scale roughly 20 log of the forward voltage. So for every stack, a doubling of the stack, you get about a 6 dB improvement. The final technique we use is, uh, what I call feedback linearization and feedback linearization is IP rel related to Marky Microwave. Uh, we haven't really published the circuits before and we give hand wavy explanations um, about how this works. But uh, what I would say is this, um, the T3 mixture was, was invented to solve a particular problem. And that problem is that if I take a standard mixer from Marky or anybody else really, and I just keep turning up the LO drive, what I find is that I don't make the mixer more linear. Uh, what I find is that it sort of plateaus and, it, and it'll stay roughly the same regardless of what the LO power is above a certain threshold. And this actually flies in the face of, of most of the math that you would see to, that predicts spurs and, or, or IP3 for that matter. In fact, um, the, the Henderson model itself breaks down in this condition and, and it doesn't actually give you realistic numbers when you start cranking up the LO. And so my dad thought about this over the years and, and roughly, I think the year was about 2004, 2005, he came up with a new circuit. And what that circuit does, and this is a hand wavy explanation, is that it senses the LO drive coming in with passive feedback circuitry. It adjusts the operating point of the mixer itself to always operate in the most optimal linear position of, of, the, of, the, of the mixer. And so it's somewhat analogous to the way you might think about how you bias an amplifier. If, if you change the, the bias points of particular amplifiers, like let's say you, you play with the gate bias in a p-hemp mixer or p-hemp amplifier, you might optimize something like the PAE, or you might optimize the linearity or the, or the noise figure, whatever it might be. Uh, it's kind of similar in this case. And so we accomplished that through a, a very clever mixer circuit called the T3. And so what it does is this mixer becomes more linear as you pump it harder. We call this feedback linearization. And so while most mixers tend to have an optimal operating point over let's say a three or four dB range, um, where after that range, after, after that limit, the mixer doesn't become more linear. The T3 become, keeps getting more linear up to about an eight to t 10 dB range while uh, maintaining a very consistent conversion loss uh, the entire, over the entire span. So that's what we're showing in these two plots. So uh, I'm not showing you a spur plot, but um, I really have a good one to pull from. But the point is that all, linear all linearities get better as you pump them harder in a T3. So uh, we can see IP3 increases, not quite dB for dB, but it's, but it's, it's close. And then um, the same goes for the P1 dB.
So uh, it's, it's a novel circuit. And um, unfortunately, I can't share with you how it works today. But um, if you worked for us, maybe I could explain it. All right. So uh, to summarize, uh, how do we get rid of spurs and mixers? Well, um, we started off and we said all devices create these M by M products. Um, we use circuit balance um, to play with the, rel the um, relative phases to cause constructive and destructive interference. And in the majority of the mixers you're going to buy from us or other people, um, the, the common spurs that will cancel will be even by even, even by odd and odd by even at the output. But as I said, remember the even by odds and odd by evens are actually available at the input ports. And this can create issues when it comes to things like reactive loading. And I think Harley is going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, perfect square waves uh, eliminate the intermod products or specifically they eliminate the M greater than one products and, and create this uh, one by N condition, which is an ideal scenario. Uh, of course, we can't generate perfect square waves. And, and as, as we get higher in frequency, this becomes more and more difficult. At very low frequencies though, you do actually see spectrums like this. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, but for the majority of our customers who are operating well above six gigahertz, there's a law of diminishing returns when it comes to LO, uh, the LO perfection, if you will. But we can do other things. We can do things like diode stacking and combining of higher power LOs with enhanced circuit balancing. And we can generate beautiful, uh, beautiful spectrums that look like this. So um, I think that just about does it for my portion. I think we are headed now to poll questions. Uh, take it away, Harley. Yeah. Thanks so much, Chris. If you haven't done, if you haven't answered the poll, uh, we'll give you a few minutes to do that. Uh, Chris, you're going to have to stop sharing your screen so I can go ahead and share it. Harley, while they're doing the poll, do you want me to answer the Q&A or do we wait to the end? Uh, I think we should wait to the end. All right. Be more. All right. Go ahead and answer it. I'll, I'll start going over the answers to them soon. You talking to me or are you talking I'm to talking people? to everybody. There's only 30% only of people have voted. Okay. It's, it's we don't out. continue unless you do it, people. Come on. Yeah. You got to get to at least 40%. There are rules here. <laughs> I can't vote. Oh man. <laughs> All right. looks like voting's died down. Um, I'll go over the answers. So question one, which of the following does not reduce the effect of spurs? That would be increasing the RF power. As Chris described, the first three all will, will reduce the effect of spurs as will increasing LO power. For the second one, which of the following circuit elements generate nonlinear distortion. Um, so this will be all nonlinear devices. So oh, diodes, um, field effect transistors, and bipolar transistors. Number three is the ideal commutator with a square wave LO generates which spurs, which is everyone got, or we got it. The hey, Harley, how do we share the results? Are they not shared? Oh, oh, I see share results. <laughs> there, there, now you should be able to see it. My bad. Um, so the ideal commutator with a square wave LO generates which spurs? It's the odd LO by one RF, odd LO coming from the square wave LO. And then finally, how can system designers reduce the effect of spurs in their systems? All of the above. So great job, everybody. Soft sharing the results. Great. So good job on the poll questions. Now that you know a bit more about where spurs come from, I want to talk to you a bit about how to predict them and how to actually measure them. So if you're a designer, you're probably already playing with various things to reduce your spurious emissions. Common methods you may or may not already be employing are changing your frequency plan just to place the spurs far away from your IF, 
You might be filtering your RF and IF path just to ensure you only have fundamental tones injected. You might be using a multiple conversion architecture wherein you will up convert to a high frequency, then down convert, placing all your spurs high out of band or playing with the power level of your incoming signals. Now, we aren't the experts on these sort of things. That's really you guys. But what we do offer are some of the highest linearity mixers out there just to minimize the need for these sort of techniques. However, all of these techniques are benefited by our ability to help you predict these spurs. So as Chris described, spurs are a multi-dimensional problem and there's many contributing factors to the spurs. Now, what's important for the system designer is how to predict them before they cause problems. And luckily, system designers have a number of tools at their disposal. So for simple CW measurements, a spectrum analyzer offers simplicity. It's filterable. I like it because you can easily see the relative power levels for every spur in your output and get a quick measurement of the spur-free dynamic range. If you're using a swept frequency plan, you may want to use something like the spur web, which shows input versus output tone or frequency relationship. Spur web is really good for telling where spurs will cross over your fundamental. So these will be unfilterable spurs. And it also gives you an approximation of the suppression based on a mathematical model of a double balanced mixer. So this is great for just quick back of the envelope predictions and verifying your frequency plan. In order to see actual variation across band, uh, you'll want to look at the swept spur plots, which we offer in our data sheets. These show spurious suppression across the mixer's entire operating band. So again, these are great for wideband applications since they're wideband measurements. However, since there are an infinite number of spurs generated, typically in our data sheets, we'll only show these swept plots for the spurs that often land close to your IF. For, like, for the first 100 spurs, we offer spur tables, which give an approximated value of the spur suppression across the entire operating band of the mixer. Now, in the following slides, I'll discuss the pros and cons of each of these methods. But before getting into that, I feel it's important to know which spurs are likely going to cause problems in your design. As Chris explained, uh, nonlinear devices, such as mixers, infinite spurs are generated. However, typically, it's only the spurs that will land close to your IF that are most troublesome. Because if they land really close, they could be hard to filter. Or if they land on top of your desired IF, completely impossible to filter out. So which spurs matter really depends on your frequency plan. If, for example, you are operating on a low side up conversion, the 2LO by minus NIF, that spur will cross over your fundamental as the IF increases high enough. Here in the spectrum analyzer view, we see that the 2LO by minus 3IF crosses over the upconverted tone. So this would be an unfilterable spur. Another thing to note is that the LO is a large signal. So the harmonics of the LO are fairly strong. Spurs that are generated from low LO harmonics will also be fairly strong. Next are in wideband frequency plans, you must pay careful attention to adjacent order spurs. What adjacent order means is that the RF and LO harmonic order differ by one. So in wideband frequency plans, these will cross over your IF and they'll be unfilterable spurs. Here in the bottom left, which kind of shows the utility of the spur web for determining crossing spurs. Because you can see the red, the red line is our down converted tone. And we see the three RF by minus two, four by minus three, and five by minus four. We can see exactly where there's gonna cross over our tone. Lastly, Anytime you are using a low IF, you must pay careful attention to spurs containing low harmonics of the IF, since these will land close to your, desire, your desired up or down converted tone. So in an up conversion, these will appear at N minus one times your IF frequency away. So if you're operating with a 100 megahertz IF, your one LO by two IF spur will only be 100 megahertz away from your desired up converted tone, which may pose a challenge to filter. In an up conversion, that spur is always going to pose a threat, the 1L by 2I, since that's always going to be the closest spur in a low IF up conversion. 
In a down conversion, you must pay careful attention to the two by twos and the three by threes and so on. These will also appear close to the IF as shown in this graphic here. Finally, if you're using a mixer that's capable of operating with a low IF, that typically means that the RF and LO are band limited to roughly an octave. We offer a slightly more in-depth discussion on this of exactly which spurs will matter in our tech note, how to tell when a spur will matter. There, we discuss a little bit more generally which spurs will matter in your system. But these spurs presented here most often cause issues. So now with not only an idea of where the spurs come from, but some insight as to which spurs might affect your application, I wanna introduce the methods we have available to us to predict these spurious power levels. And the first prediction method is circuit analysis via the Henderson model. So Chris briefly touched on the Henderson model. It's a fairly simple way to model a mixer developed by Bert Henderson, and it easily calculates spurious suppression in a double balanced mixer with fairly reasonable accuracy, given just a few assumptions about the behavior of the diodes. Namely, what we assume is we can ignore mixing due to the diodes nonlinearity. So what this means is that the diodes operate as ideal switches, wherein if the voltage across any given diode, which is the RF plus the LO voltage, if that's greater than the turn on voltage of the diode, then current can flow unimpeded. And if that voltage is less than the turn on voltage, then there's an infinite resistance and no current flows. The second assumption we make is that if a switch is open, if a diode's open, then no IF current can flow through that diode. However, if it's closed, if the switch is closed, then an IF current is generated and that IF current is proportional to the RF voltage. Now, let's take a minute to think about that because that proportionality should make some sense. You can think of it like this. The LO is the strong signal, and its job is to effectively turn on the diodes and determine the path the RF signal can take. In doing that, it's essentially just chopping up that RF signal by multiplying it by one or minus one at the IF output, as shown here in the uh, animation in the corner. Now, with these assumptions, you might be wondering, didn't Chris discuss this? And didn't, didn't the poll question ask, wouldn't this generate odd LO by one RF only? Well, what the Henderson model does is instead of the idea of a perfect square wave LO, the LO is a cosine. So although the diodes still turn on like switches, the LO is no longer the only thing contributing to that on state of the switch. In other words, when a large signal square is used, no matter what, the RF signal is going to be too weak to modulate the diode. The LO turns on and it turns on the diode. The RF is too weak to back bias that diode. Now, when the LO is not a square and there's some finite slew to the LO, there will be a point where the LO is really, really close to turning on the diode. It's, the diode is almost on. It is so close that the weak RF signal, it momentarily has the power to modulate the diode. It is in that moment when the RF and LO are intermodulating for a little bit, for a short time, that all N by N harmonics show up. So already, this shows something fairly novel about the Henderson model, which is it really doesn't matter whether we're going to use ideal or realistic diodes. The result is the same, which is that all intermodulation distortion is generated in a double balanced mixer. So this model then generates a mathematical expression for the IF based on the switching behavior of the diodes. Now that mathematical expression describes the entire output spectrum, the fundamental and all spurs. You can think of it as describing exactly what you see on the spectrum analyzer. Then this is converted into the frequency domain to get scaling terms for all spurs in the term of these Fourier coefficients. The Henderson model culminates in this expression for IM suppression, which is the RF spur order minus one multiplied by the difference in the incoming power levels of the signals plus 
20 log of that scaling term, of that Fourier coefficient. Now, looking at this, it should be fairly obvious to all of you that the trickiest bit of information is that Fourier coefficient, because for that, you need the derived IF current for this double balance mixer. So let's investigate that in a little bit more detail. It can be shown that the Fourier coefficient of the derived IF current is equivalent to this expression. Now, don't get overwhelmed by the math because what's interesting is highlighted, which is in the derivation of the IF current, we obtain scaling terms that are dependent on the parity of the spur. These are these B terms, OO for odd, odd, even, even, odd, even, even, odd, and even an IF scaling term. Each of these terms, they are directly proportional to the balance of the balance and the mismatch of the diodes. So what this means is that a mixer designer can intentionally play with the balance of a ballon to suppress certain spurs in a, say, a custom job. Another interesting thing that we see is in these odd by even and even by odd spurs, they are multiplied by V sub F, which is defined as the ratio of the forward voltage of the diode to the LO voltage. So this has interesting implications, which is that an infinitely large signal LO or a zero volt turn on would completely eliminate those spurs. And this is true. We know in practice that increasing LO drive is a great way to suppress spurs. Oftentimes, if customers come to us and ask, how can I suppress the spur further? One of the first things we may ask is, can you supply more LO power? Now, there's, we find that too much LO power can also cause issues, hence the reason for the range on our data sheets of LO power. Finally, each of these uh, B scaling terms for the parity of the spur, they're multiplied by M, which is the RF spur order. So this explains why in the IM suppression expression, we only have it relative to M, but it also explains why, if you ever looked at our data sheets, if you've looked at the typical spurious suppression performance plots, you may have seen this line in the description, which says spurious suppression is scaled for different RF power levels. So this is the mathematical reason behind that. Now, as Chris described, an ideal double balance mixer will suppress all, all even order spurs via the balance of the mixer. However, to account for a non-ideal circuit balance, as well as bring this model a bit closer to reality, the Henderson model detunes the circuit balance by deriving the IF current with variables for balance and mismatch. This is actually how we know that the spur scaling terms are directly related to balance, mismatch, and the RF spur order. Including these terms for balance, provides very realistic residual spur levels. And this is the model that our spur calculator and spur web is based on. So I'm sure you're wondering how, how good of a model is this? So we'll examine the validity now. Here we analyze the suppression of the three LO by minus two RF spur in two double balance mixers. One is the ideal mixer with perfect balance. And one has somewhat realistic imbalance of the balance and somewhat realistic mismatch of the diodes. So in the ideal case, what do we see? We see that there's an infinite suppression of the spur. So does this make sense? Yes, this actually does make sense. Because recall, ideally, in, per in a perfect double balance mixer, the balance will suppress uh, even order spurs at the IF output. This being a perfectly balanced mixer, we should see infinite suppression. In the second case, we have our balance slightly unbalanced, slightly more realistic, as well as the diodes slightly mismatched. And what we find is that when we make these assumptions about the mixer, we get a calculated suppression of minus 56.7 dBc. Now, let me tell you, this is much more realistic. But how close is this to an actual three by two spur? We can compare it to the spur table on the right here for the MM10222H, one of our double balanced mixers. We see that the 3LO by 2IF down converted spur is sitting at 59 dBc for configuration A and 57 dBc for configuration B. So what this shows is that by making these small assumptions about the behavior of the diodes and including somewhat realistic imbalance of our balance, 
we can derive a mathematical expression for the IF that is reasonably accurate. However, it is true with different initial conditions, you would of course yield a slightly different suppression. However, the real, the beauty of this model is that when Bert Henderson derived this, he was able to account for non-ideal phase and amplitude balance of the balance. So this makes the Henderson model a very powerful tool for studying the threat of spurs at a high level in your system. But now I ask you this, why do we use the spur table as our measure of success? I mean, is the three by two spur in the MM10222, is it a flat line at 59 dBC? It, 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 it isn't, it varies with frequency. So let's figure out what exactly is happening in the spur table. Spur tables are great. They provide measured data for all the relevant spurs in a mixer. But how exactly do we get this data? Well, down conversion spurs are tested by injecting a swept fundamental RF tone and mixing it with a swept fundamental LO tone to produce a fixed IF. We then tune our receiver, in this case a VNA, we tune it to receive the spur of interest. Then we just take the median value of the spurious suppression across the entire operating band of the mixer, the entire thing. We take the median value and that's what makes it onto the spur table. So why are these good? They take into account actual balan balance and diode mismatch present on the actual mixer die that you are going to use. They're great for wideband applications since they give you an approximate level for the entire operating band of the mixer. However, they can be off by as much as 30 dB, so you can't use it as a hard limit of spurious suppression. For example, we can look at the 2IF by 1LO spur. On the right, I plotted the swept plot, and on the left, we have the spur table. If we look around 5 gigahertz, configuration B is spot on with the spur table. We see a suppression of minus 70 dBc on the spur plot, and the spur table, same thing. Configuration A, on the other hand, I, we see a suppression of what looks like minus 53, which is quite far off from the 69 on the spur table. So it, the spur tables are really useful early in the design phase, verifying a proof of concept. However, if more accuracy is required, this may not be the right tool for you. What you might need to do is you might need to simulate. Luckily, we offer nonlinear device models. Now, these nonlinear device models are the most accurate prediction method available without having to sit in front of a VNA. Allow me to repeat that. The nonlinear device models are the most accurate prediction method available to you without having to sit in front of a VNA and take any measurements. These are physics based models. They take into account the 3D geometry of the mixer die and then built into a circuit simulator, both for microwave office and Keysight ADS. Now, the nonlinear device models are really powerful because they offer you the ability to simulate your specific frequency plan, as in you can input your RF, LO, IF frequencies and power levels versus the purely wideband measurements that we place on the data sheet. Another really powerful tool uh, that the simulator offers is you can even simulate non 50 ohm impedances at the ports. This is something we can't measure for you in our lab. So this is extremely helpful for when simulating performance and you know the terminating impedances of your ports on your mixer. Now something to note about these nonlinear device models. High powered spurs are more accurately simulated than low power spurs. So spurs like your one by one, LO feed through and maybe some of the low LO harmonics, these will come through a bit more accurately than say the seven by five spur. Since it's lower, it's gonna be simulated a little bit more inaccurately. Another thing is in my experience using the device models is if you're not careful, you can get somewhat nonsensical results when simulating spurs. So using it requires some form of intuition and you have to scrutinize the data to effectively use it. Where might you find some form of intuition of the spur level? Well, you could use spur tables, 
You can use the SPUR calculator, the SPUR web, the swept data sheet plots. Basically, anything we've discussed up until now is a usable method to just get an idea of what the SPUR level will be. Now, we've had times where there's a project where the inaccuracies of low powered SPURs in the simulator just won't cut it. If you just need to know what is the value of this low powered SPUR, you're going to have to measure. Now, there are two main methods to measure SPURs, which is using a spectrum analyzer and a vector network analyzer. And when you use one versus the other, primarily depends on if you're measuring a CW or a swept frequency plan. So spectrum analyzer is great for CW plans. You can easily and visually see where all the SPURs will land in your output and see the relative power levels. Another benefit of the spectrum analyzer is it is filterable, meaning when you inject a source, you can filter so only your fundamental is injected and no harmonics. Uh, a thing that we often use a spectrum analyzer at Markey is for spot checking. So if you took some data and you're not quite sure if, uh, if one frequency point looks right, you can test just the one frequency point on the spectrum analyzer quite easily. Vector network analyzers, on the other hand, those are great for swept measurements. However, they're not as easily filterable. Another benefit of them is you can easily do math with your traces and get straight to the DBC value. And this is the method that we use to get the data in our spur tables. We, we get a swept spur plot and then take the median value. Uh, another measurement-based prediction is, are the spur tables. Now, these can work for CW measurements or swept measurements. Since it's just an average across band, it can be an average for either CW or swept. Now, despite measured data being exactly that, despite it being measured data, results can still be somewhat deceiving. And when verifying and looking at measured data, you still have to take some careful considerations into account. These can be the internal spurs from the measurement equipment itself. So spectrum analyzers and vector network analyzers, they have receiver circuitry on their input, which has a mixer. So all, everything that we've talked about mixer spurs up until now applies to the mixers inside your test equipment. So for example, LO feed through is fairly strong and on the mixers inside your VNA, that will still be strong. A trick that you can do to see if what you're measuring is really coming from your device that you're testing or the measurement equipment is you can add some known attenuation between your device under test and what you're testing with. And if the spur varies by just that attenuation value, you can be pretty confident that that is a real spur that you're measuring from your device under test. If it doesn't vary by the attenuator value, then it's likely that that spur is at least in part contributed to the internal spurs coming from the mixers in your test equipment. Next is something I touched on briefly in the last slide, which is you can't assume ideal sources. The sources you use are likely dirty and have a strong second and maybe third harmonic. If you don't filter these out when you inject them into your mixer, these will act as fundamental tones and create more spurs, reducing the dynamic range of your system. Next are non-50 ohm impedances at your ports. So this is where Chris's discussion of which ports the even order spurs are collected at is very important. If you don't have a proper termination at your RF and LO ports, those spurs that are coming out of there will reflect back into your mixer. Excuse me. They'll reflect back into your mixer, remix and generate more spurs. Uh, this also happens at the plane of your measurement device. If there's not a 50 ohm impedance there, they'll reflect back in just generating more spurs and reducing the dynamic range of your system. Lastly are just system parasitics. So everything from spurs coming off of your power supply, adjacent channel interference, packaging parasitics, even just how you attach a surface mount component to the board, uh, reflected spurs, even ADCs, they're prone to distortion which can mask the true level of your spur. So although this talk has only really discussed two inputs and a single output, when you're using a spur, you must be uh, 
careful of all spurs generated in the system, not just the ones going directly into your mixer. So thanks all for coming and listening. I hope you learned a bit. I'm just gonna drive home our main points right now. So what exactly is a spur? Well, spurs are those N by N tones that are created in all nonlinear circuits. And how are they created? How are these spurs created? Well, any nonlinear circuit intermodulates two signals to create all integer harmonics. In diode mixers, what we've been talking about, the spurs manifest in two, two places, both the nonlinear IV characteristic of the diode combined with the inability of the large signal LO to be the sole contributor of that on-off impedance of the switch during the transition region. How do we reduce the impact of these spurs at a design level as mixer designers? Well, there's circuit balance as the main technique. There's also advanced circuit topologies, such as the T3 mixer that Chris went over using a square wave LO, or even just increasing your diode, getting a beefier diode on your, on your mixer. How can you reduce the impact of spurs at, at a system level, as system designers? Well, changing frequency plans is, is fairly common, just placing the spurs away from your IF. Using multiple conversion architectures, up convert, place all the spurs high out of band before you down convert. You may play with your input powers or you might just choose a better mixer. There might just be a better mixer suited for your application. Now, how do we, as Marky engineers, how do we predict spurs? Well, we use the Henderson model as a first order approximation. And if we need a little bit more reality, we will use the nonlinear device models. And finally, how do we measure spurs? Very, very carefully. Thanks again. If you enjoyed this and you want to learn a bit more, we have a few more webinars coming up. Uh, May 14th, Chris is going to be presenting on high frequency packaging. And then May 28th, Rob Maurer is going to be presenting on amplifiers for synthesizers and LO generation. Thanks again. Chris and I are going to stay on the line now for any Q&A that you might have. All right, Harley. Uh, should we just go through this list? Yeah, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Okay. All right. You want me to read these off? Yeah. All right. Okay. 